You're listening to sermon recordings from Living Word Free Lutheran Church in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. We kick off a new series focused on thankfulness as we look at the book of Colossians. Pastor Kirk Thorson teaches from Colossians 1 as we look at what it means to be thankful saints. Isn't that a beautiful promise given? A promise in Revelation that God would be in their midst. He will be their shepherd. He will be their light. There'll be no more hunger, no more thirsty, no more needs, no more sorrow, no more sickness. And it says, God will wipe away every tear from their eye. I think there's so many things around us in our world that can uh, cause us alarm and concern and anxiety. And yet we have that wonderful promise of how God promises to deal with his people, with his saints. Our sermon series for this month of November, before we uh, enter Advent and preparing for Christmas, is going to be found in the book of Colossians here. And I want to give just a little bit of background here on the book of Colossians. If we're going to spend some time reading the book, I think it's good to have an understanding and a knowledge of how this book came into be. Colossae was a city in modern-day Turkey, kind of in the central part of that region there. And it's one of the letters that the Apostle Paul sent to a number of churches in that area, in Greece and Turkey, that he worked with and encouraged. This one is interesting, though, this book of Colossians, in that Paul was not able to be there in person to write to that church. You think of some of the other letters that Paul wrote, uh, for instance, to the Corinthians, for example. He goes into detail about some of the issues and struggles there, and he talks about how he's been there among them. But Paul had never been to this church in Colossae before. And he says, I've never even met most of the people who make up that church. In, in Colossians 2.1, Paul speaks to that fact, and he says, most of the believers in that city have not met me personally. But Paul had a connection there with those folks and with those people. Uh, he had spent a number of years, three years, in Ephesus, a nearby city, a, a capital city for that region. And during those three and a half years, people from all over the province of modern-day Turkey would have come to hear Paul teach and preach. And they would have become converted, and they would have gone back to their hometowns. And so at that same time, Paul's co-workers and converts were very active in carrying the gospel from Ephesus to cities throughout the region. And undoubtedly, Colossae was one of the many cities to which the gospel came in that way. Colossians has four chapters, and it was very easy for me to look at and just say, well, I think I can take a chapter a Sunday. We're not going to read the whole chapter but find something to be thankful for and encouraged by in the book of Colossians. Before we read our sermon text this morning, I've got a picture I'm going to put up here. Yeah, this is a, it's a little bit blurry here, but uh, when our kids were younger, we did a 30 days of Thanksgiving in which you list the things that you're thankful for. That's a really good thing. If there ever was a year to try to work hard on finding things that you're thankful for, Isn't this the year to stop and think about that? Because yes, there's lots of things for us to be concerned by, but there's lots of things that we can be encouraged by and give thanks for. And so I think I went back and looked. This was on my phone, a picture from 2012. Okay, So this would have been um, uh, the top one there. Things that we were thankful for. We each got to live a thing. We each got to list a thing. Living in North Dakota, you probably don't have to think real hard as to which member of the Thorson family picked that one. That was Jen. Uh, I think she should work on commission along with some of you who've lived in North Dakota uh, for the Tourism and Convention Bureau. You're always bragging about how good North Dakota is. So my wife put, it was a blessing to live in North Dakota. And, and that might be hard for some of you people in South Dakota to hear, but even as someone who, who didn't grow up in North Dakota, I grew up in Illinois, you know what? It was a blessing to live in North Dakota. Uh, we would go back and visit my family in Illinois and my friends, and they would ask questions like, did it really hit 45 below air temperature in North Dakota? And I would say, yes, it did. Or they would say, did you really have 26 inches of snow the first weekend in April? And I would say, yes, we did. And then later on, some of those same friends would say, is it true that you have 2% unemployment rates in North Dakota? And I would say, yes, that's true. And they would say, is it true that the state of North Dakota is actually cutting property taxes and giving refunds because they have a balanced budget and they don't need to take extra money from their residents? And I would say, yes, that's true. So North Dakota had miserable weather, but wonderful people. 
And so I'll concur with my wife. We, we were blessed to live in North Dakota, blessed to live in South Dakota. I think, too, even we just look around at the news and events and things taking place around our country, we're very fortunate to live where we live, aren't we? Yeah. Uh, we had another entry here. Someone wrote they were thankful for rest. That looks like Will's handwriting. I'm not quite entirely sure what he was getting at, if he was looking for brownie points or what. But um, we can be thankful for rest. There's times where we have to work hard, and there's times where we're thankful that we can rest. Sundays, our Sabbath, a day of rest, a day to relax, but a day to rejoice in God's goodness and worship him. And so I pray that you have known God's rest and peace in your life. This next one isn't very spiritual, and I didn't know that eight years later I'd be using this for a sermon illustration. But I, I put down that I was thankful that the Chicago Bears were 7-1 and one at that time. And uh, you know what happened after that? I went back and checked. Uh, the Chicago Bears lost five out of the six next games and were knocked out of playoff contention. And that kind of goes to show there can be some things that we're really excited about and enthused about, and in the end it kind of fizzles out. And that kind of is a reminder, too, that we can be thankful in the small things and big things, but, but man, we should really take heart in those things that we can be thankful for for all eternity. God's care and love for us and the blessings of family and friends. Lydia, no, I'm sorry, Leah was thankful for goats. That was an interesting one, but she was thankful that God made them. And we can be thankful for the beauty of God's creation. Have you seen some of the sunsets these last evenings? They've been absolutely beautiful. Uh, we were outside last night and noticed the beautiful moon that was in the sky. Man, the beauty of God's creation is just amazing. And so we can be thankful for, for many things. And, and today we're going to be thankful together uh, about the fact that, that we are saints in the Lord. If you are a Christian, you are a saint. We're going to read about that in Colossians chapter 1, and we're going to read verses 1 through 14. God, I thank you for your word. Thank you for the truths that you speak to us and convey in, the, in this message. And I'm thankful that you don't rely upon me, my cleverness, my wit, my wisdom to, to wow people or, or win them over to something or try to trick them into believing something, but that your word is true. That your Holy Spirit knows exactly what each of us have faced and, and need to hear and that you can impart that to them. And so, God, I ask that you would bless this time now. That you would... Bless the words that come from my mouth, that they would not be my words, but your words, Lord. And we thank you in advance for the work that you'll do in this time now. Amen. Reading in Colossians chapter 1, and uh, I'm going to read verses, I think I'm going to read verses uh, 1 through uh, 6 for now. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, since we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Of this you have heard before in the word of truth, the gospel, which has come to you as indeed in the whole world it is bearing fruit and growing, as it also does among you, since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth. We can stop there for now because I want to focus uh, on the key theme in this passage and then look a little bit closely here at, at what's going on in verses 1 and 2 and 3. And so... Uh, I have a little different way of looking at this passage here. Normally I've got point number one, point number two, point number three. I think the first thing we want to look at here is the key theme in this passage. What's the, the good news that's being conveyed here to those who were living as Colossians and to those in faith today in Christ Jesus? And here's the good news that you have. That even though you are a sinner, and even though I am a sinner in the eyes of man, I am a saint because of the work of Jesus. Those statements are both true. You are a sinner and you are a saint. If you weren't a sinner, we wouldn't confess our sins every Sunday. If you weren't a sinner, you would have no need of ever offending anyone or being wrong. No one would ever get upset with you or frustrated with you. But that's not true. You're a sinner, I'm a sinner. But then... 
we are also forgiven and loved by God. And because of what Jesus Christ has done, we are a saint. And so that's the big picture idea that I want you to take away from our time together in God's word. That you are a sinner, yes, but you're also a saint. Both are true. And they kind of go together. And if we're not willing to admit and recognize, yeah, I'm a sinner, then we're taking God's love and mercy and grace for granted. That's a dangerous place to be. And then I know there are other people who are just kind of dispositioned to always focus on maybe some of the negative things, either on other people or maybe even in their own life. And they can be their own worst critics. And I've met and visited with people who say, you know, I mess up so much. How could God love me or forgive me? Why would he want to forgive me day after day? And I say, that's a really good question. And if you were doing that to me day after day, I think I'd have a hard time forgiving you. You're right. But you know what? God makes that promise that he does love you and does forgive you. And so we can take God at his word. We can hold to that promise of God that he does love us and that he does forgive us. That's what makes him God and that's what makes us as humans. And so I want to look today. We're going to look and see what does it mean to be a saint. You know, what comes to your mind when you think of a saint? Um, I have a nephew, Caden, who loves the New Orleans Saints, the football team, okay, based out of Louisiana. So we think of a saint, maybe you think of a football player. Um, you think of a saint, maybe you think of Mother Teresa or someone like that. Or maybe you think of a dear uh, person in the church that you've known for years and just has a wonderful disposition and, and no one can hardly say a bad thing about them. Maybe they're a saint. But scripture says that saints are holy ones in the Lord. And not just one person, not just a few select people, and maybe this is a little different than maybe the way that our friends in the Catholic Church would view a saint. They would say a, a saint is someone who is a fantastic Christian, and they kind of have a process of how they work through defining what a saint is. Uh, someone where a miracle had to be performed, and it has to be verifiable, and there's going to be some extra things that you do, and then... Once that person has passed away, then they are considered a saint. Okay? Um, I think if we look here clearly, it says that saints are holy ones in the Lord. And even thinking of other verses, um, in the Psalms, for instance, precious in the eyes of the Lord is the death of his saints. And here in Colossians, it speaks of others as saints. And so the saints aren't just a select few people, but they're all those, as Revelation said, who have been washed white by Jesus. And so if you're sitting here today in person, you can squeeze your wife's hand and say, Honey, I'm a saint. And if you're watching at home on the couch, you can look at your kids and say, You know what? I'm a saint in the Lord. And it's true. We are. A declaration of who these saints are. They are holy ones in the Lord. As Paul is writing this letter, as he's led by the Holy Spirit, he addresses those who are holy and faithful brothers in the church. Holy ones are those who've been set apart from the world by God to love and serve and glorify him. And so we would say, well, the people who made up that church, the Colossians, they were holy ones. They were saints. They'd been faithful to the Lord Jesus. And so Paul wants to write and encourage them and who they are. And the same way God wants to encourage us, he wants us to know who we are. Isn't that one of the first things you teach your kids when they're really little? They pick up their name, your first name, your last name, okay? Now, where do you live? They need to know their identity. And we as God's children, we too need to know our identity, that we are loved and that we are forgiven and that we are holy ones. We are saints in the eyes of God. Paul also uses two other words then to these saints in the last half of verse 2. Grace to you and peace from God our Father. You know, some churches that are a bit more liturgical or perhaps formal, uh, the pastor always begins the message in that way. And sometimes some people hear that and it kind of goes in one ear and out the other. But, you know, I think there was a reason Paul began many of his letters that way because you know what he wanted his people to be reminded of? 
the blessings of God's grace and to ensure that they knew God's peace. Grace and peace to you. Grace is God's unmerited favor and love for sinners. And that's demonstrated to us even by all that Jesus went through for us, leaving the glories of heaven and, and coming to earth. You know, I always appreciated in North Dakota when people would come back from Arizona and Florida, they'd come back in time for Easter, we'd still have two and a half feet of snow on the ground, it would be zero, but they wanted to be back in time for Easter. I thought, wow, think of what those people went through and the change and the adjustments they made so they could be back and be with their family and be with their church family. That's pretty amazing. Think of what Jesus went through, leaving the glories of heaven. You know, we just read about it in Revelation, how wonderful heaven is. No suffering, no want, no struggles, no sorrow, no tears. And he came to earth, and we can all testify to this firsthand. We know how difficult things can be here on earth. And Jesus experienced every single one of those things for us on our behalf. Jesus went through all of that, not because we were really good people, but because that was a picture of God's grace and love for us that we never earned or deserved. And so, yes, we are saints, but we also recognize we are saints not because we're really good people, not because we're kind of a Mother Teresa type person and everyone looks at us in awe and wonder, but we are saints, we are loved and forgiven and perfect because of God's grace. These saints are also given a wonderful gift. They're given a gift of peace from God. Peace that speaks of peace of heart and peace of conscience, peace of mind. It speaks of the assurance that God gives to believers, that their sins are forgiven and that they don't need to live in fear of God. There's no greater blessings that can be given on anyone than the blessings from God of grace and peace. And the apostle identifies God the Father as the giver of this peace. And I didn't mean to take a whole lot of time in this, but I just think in, in the time in which we live right now with all that's going on around us, if you're concerned about a virus or you're concerned about uh, the elections, I think there's a lot of people around us, maybe even people hearing this today or here right now, who would say, you know what, I don't have peace. I've got a lot of other things going around in my heart and my mind. Peace is not one of them. And I think we are reminded time and time again, of how we need God's peace. God's peace is a wonderful peace that passes all understanding, according to Philippians 4, verse 6 and 7, it guards our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And it doesn't mean everything's perfect, and it doesn't mean everything's fine, but it's that peace, that knowledge of resting and trusting in God and his love and care for us. Dear ones, saints, I hope you have that peace. You need God's peace. We need that peace. And so this is uh, part, then, of, of what those saints experience. So those saints, uh, they are godly ones in the Lord. We also note, how does this come? In verse 3, it, it says that, that this comes, it's a result of faith. It's a result of faith. Verses 3 and 4, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you since we've heard of your faith in Christ Jesus. I think that's interesting because Paul has never met these folks and yet he's willing to call them saints. This is kind of like being the equivalent of you or I writing a job recommendation for someone that we've never met, right? Wouldn't that be a little unnerving? You're thinking, wait a minute, I've never met any of you and yet I'm going to speak highly of you. And that's exactly what Paul is doing here. Why could he do that? Not because he knew how much money they gave, not because he knew how many years they'd been a member at the church at Colossae there. You know, he didn't know that so-and-so sat in that seat at home church for so many years there among the Colossians. No, Paul says, I know of your faith. It is your faith that makes you a saint. I think of how many people think, well, you know, I kind of have to build up some equity here with God by the things that I do. That's not the way that we earn favor with God. We are saints as a result of faith. This all comes because of faith. Paul says, we've heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love you have for all the saints. Isn't this interesting? Paul calls them saints not because of what they've done, but because of who they know. Because they know and love Jesus, that is what makes them saints. That's why you could leave here after church today 
and, and you could um, almost get into a fender bender at the intersection at 85th and Western, and maybe in anger or frustration, you honk your horn, and you go, oh, man, that was awful. What an awful and dumb thing to do right after church, right after we just hear this sermon about being saints in the Lord. And you say, okay, God, you need to forgive me. I lost my cool there for just a minute. And yet you're still a saint. Not because of what you've done or haven't done, but because of your faith. We are saints. We are saved. We are forgiven because of our faith in Jesus. And so just we need to hear that again and again. We are saints not because of what we've done, not because of the heirs and maybe even the, the way we try to portray ourselves in front of other people. That's not what makes us a saint. We're saints because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. And then note in verse 4 with me what follows. Hope and love flow from this faith. We've heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints. And then verse 5 says, Because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of this you have heard before in the word of truth, the gospel. Hope and love come from this faith. You know, the Colossians' faith and love, Paul says, comes from this hope. And these characteristics that we have as saints then begin to interact with one another, and the more there is of one, the more there is of the other, which also, consequently, the same is true for the negative things in our life, right? Where there's um, insecurity or frustration or bitterness or jealousy, those things just tend to build on one another. In the same way, if you have faith and hope and love in building qualities, the more there is of one, the more will be of another. That's the way it works with this, faith, hope, and love. And so through God's gospel promises, the Holy Spirit works this in our life. Faith and hope and love. Faith means trusting in God and in his provision, his care, his love for us. And the more we know of how God has loved us and cared for us, then the more we can have that love for others. And here it says that this love then just wasn't for God the Father, but it was for others as they prayed for them. And cared for them. I pray today for you that you would be abounding in faith and hope and love. A faith in God looks to Him to meet those needs, looks to God to, to answer those questions that you can't answer on your own. And then I think it would do wise to note how these saints benefited from others. We see that beginning in verse 7. These saints benefited from, A, the faithful teaching of Epaphras. So Paul is writing to them and he says, You've heard and understood these things, the grace of God and truth. Verse 7, Just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant, he's a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and has made known to us your love in the Spirit. I mentioned that Paul had not been to visit the Colossians. Epaphras was their pastor. He was their preacher. He was their faithful teacher. He was the one who does the work. And, and Paul addresses him as a dear fellow servant. We believe that Epaphras is probably one of those first who heard the gospel from Paul at Ephesus and then returned to his hometown and began a church plant there, even perhaps under the apostles' direction. And so these saints then, they, they just weren't Lone Ranger Christians, so they didn't think, you know what? I can handle life on my own. I really don't need anyone else. I can take care of things on my own. No, they benefited from others. And I think this is where we see the, the blessings and benefit of Christian community and fellowship. And so these saints benefited from the teaching of others. And then we read in verses 8 through 11 here, that these saints also benefited from the prayers of other believers, verses 8 through 11. And so from the day we have heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking you that may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. May you be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy. Here we have other people praying for them. And so they benefited from that. Again, there's a, 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 
a desire to pray for others and love on others and show your care and concern for them and to lift them up in prayer. One of the greatest things we can do even as we gather as a church body is yes, to worship God, but then to come together corporately and pray, to confess our sins, to receive forgiveness, to give thanks for the blessings that we have, and then also to lift up and pray for others. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. You know, I think that'll be one of the really interesting, and interesting is probably a really poor word, amazing things. If we have knowledge when we get to heaven, and we can know of people who have prayed for us and how those prayers were answered, wouldn't that be an amazing thing to think? Think of how many times parents pray for their children, of how grandparents pray for their children, Sunday school teachers pray for kids, or youth group leaders pray for kids, and we really don't really know sometimes how those prayers get answered over the course of years and of a life. But isn't it amazing just to stop and think about people in your own life who've been praying for you? What a blessing that is. I think of that and I think, you know what? I want to be a part of that blessing too. I want to be praying for other people. And I'm thankful that God hears our prayers and his grace and mercy, he, he answers that. And so we can be thankful. We can be blessed by the way in which others have lifted us up in prayer and how God has pray, uh, answered those prayers. So we can look around, and, and so for the Colossians, they had the example given of Epaphras, and then they had, had this reminder, other people are praying for you too. And then here we see the grace and goodness of God in verses 12 through 14. I think this is a perfect tie-in with last week with what um, Bill Buck shared on, on the effects of grace. Grace is one of those things that as Lutherans, we really focus on a lot. It, it, you might say it's, it's, it's a lens in which we view the spiritual life and we view Scripture. We focus on grace a lot because we know that we mess up a lot. And if you mess up a lot, isn't it good to know that God is gracious and loving and kind and forgiving? And so as Lutherans, we talk a lot about grace and we look at how God gives us grace in baptism and communion and through his word and through the work of the Holy Spirit. Here, the grace and goodness of God in verses 12 through 14 giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Those verses are just absolutely packed with ways in which God has been good to us. He has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints. Again, there's that word saints. And again, it's for all of God's holy ones, but you've been qualified. That means someone did something for you. you know? uh, sometimes we get letters in the mail, I bet you do too. You are pre-qualified for some sort of a visa card. You're pre-qualified for this or that. I got pre-qualified for AARP. How is that even possible? Jen said, how old are you? I said, that's junk mail, sweetheart. I said, you don't read that. Yeah. You get things all the time that we're approved for, pre-approved for. It doesn't make one bit of difference. It doesn't even apply to us. Or you don't want it. It's junk. But here, verse 12 says, God has qualified you, you who had no business getting these blessings from God. God has qualified you to share in the inheritance and if you receive an inheritance, you don't earn an inheritance. You're given it because you're in the family. Isn't that a beautiful picture there? We are in God's family, and because of that, we receive this inheritance. And then it says, He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son. You know, in Bible times, when one foreign enemy would come in and conquer a land, they would pick people up and move them and put them in another land or territory. It was kind of their way of breaking the will and the spirit of the people. Think of what that meant for um, the Jews when they were put into Babylonian captivity, exile for those 70 years. They lost their identity. They lost their nation. And in that same way, if you're picked up from one place and put in another, that's the idea, the word picture here, of being picked up in our sin and guilt and shame and being under control of the devil and put in God's kingdom. We're picked up from one place, we're moved, we're delivered, we're transferred to another kingdom in which we have redemption and the forgiveness of our sins. That's pretty amazing and remarkable to think about. 
And again, these things happen to these saints, these holy ones, not because of what they've done. Paul doesn't go through and say, hey, because you've done this, this, and this, you qualify for this. No, these things all come because of faith. These saints then, They bear fruit in every good work as God works through them in their words and in their thoughts and deeds that please God. These are all fruits of their faith. It's it's not the cause of them being a saint, but it's rather the effect. It's what flows out of their life because of the work of the Holy Spirit. As Christians grow in their knowledge of God and of his love for them, their faith grows. And a growing faith will always reveal itself more and more in the fruits and in the life of those saints of those holy ones. We have much to be thankful for. We can be thankful that we live in South Dakota. We can be thankful for beautiful sunsets and sunrises and the full moon we saw last night. We can be thankful for the beauty of God's creation. We can even be thankful for sports teams that we get to follow and and minor trivial things like that. But we can be thankful today that we, even though we're sinners, we are saints in the eyes of the Lord and the blessing that comes with that. Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for your your word today and for your reminder. God, we ask that we would be filled with assurance, that wonderful knowledge of all that you have done for us, that we would realize nothing, nothing comes from us or from our own doing, but all these good and perfect gifts you give to us come because of your goodness and love. So God, help us to rejoice in that. Help us to love you all the more and to love those around us. Encourage us, God, in that, for whatever today and this week ahead holds. We ask all this now in Jesus' name. Amen. You've been listening to sermon audio from Living Word Free Lutheran Church in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. For more information about our congregation, please visit livingwordfreelutheran.org. To go straight to more sermon recordings, simply visit livingwordfreelutheran.org slash sermons.